Together, please, for Matthew Trinich and his talk. Thanks for that introduction. So I'm Matt Trinesh. I work at IBM Research on the Quantum Computing Project. And I'm here today to talk to you about um, compilers for quantum computers. Um, before I get started, though, I do want to preface this. I've had a lot of questions this week about quantum computing and quantum information theory. I actually gave a talk last year on those topics at Christchurch at LCA, and the talk's up on YouTube. And also, at the end of my talk, I have a lot of links to more information on that. Uh, this talk is just going to be about the compiler and how you can compile programs for quantum computers. So with that, um, let's get started. And to really talk about compilers, we need to talk about how people write programs for quantum computers. Um, this is a quantum circuit. Um, it is used to represent a program or, um, uh, for a quantum computer. It's just there to show the operations that run on each qubit, so we're writing um, a program as individual operations on qubits, and here we can see some quantum gates uh, on qubit zero and qubit one, and then we have two measurement operations which measure the state of the qubit, which collapses it to a zero or a one, and writes those out to a classical bit, uh, which is C0 and C1. They're read from left to right, and they're really only there to show dependency of operations. There's no implicit timing information in a quantum circuit. Um, and the operations that we run on a qubit are called quantum gates. Um, quantum gates are reversible, um, unlike operations on classical computers, this uh, reversible model of computation, so it works either direction. Um, and each gate is represented by a unitary matrix. Um, when you run, uh, this example here is a uh, block sphere, um, and it's very useful to think about operations on single qubits as rotations on a sphere. The block sphere is a geometric representation for quantum state. You can think of it as that, vector, that orange vector, and you perform a, you apply a quantum gate to a qubit, and it moves that vector around. And you can think of the operations on a single qubit as just moving that vector around in 3D space. Uh, it's a very helpful model to conceptualize what's going on. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated when you involve multiple qubits. And there are a lot of quantum gates. Uh, these are just some of them that uh, I'm going to be talking about in the slide. Um, in the slides, they're not, uh, you don't really have to worry about the matrix. I just put that in there for completeness sake. So you can see that when you apply multiple qubits, the matrix grows uh, exponentially. Um, but there are some common gates here. Uh, they're the X, Y, and Z gates. Those are just rotating 180 degrees over the X, Y, and Z axis in that block sphere representation. There's the Hadamard gate, which is the one we, I had on the screen before, which just goes from zero to plus x, or one to minus x. Um, and then there's C-naught, which is used to entangle qubits, and uh, it's just a knot operation. And then there are also arbitrary rotation gates, which are these ones on the top on the right. These take in a parameter and rotate along an axis or along multiple axes. Um, in that block sphere, so moving that vector around an arbitrary uh, rotation. And then there's a swap gate, which is uh, fun because it swaps the state of the qubits um, by entangling them together. It, uh, if one qubit is a one, the other is a zero, the states will flip when you apply a swap gate, which will become pretty important in compiler design. And while graphical pictures are nice, we're all programmers, and it's nice to see code. And there is a language, OpenCASM, or Open Quantum Assembly Language, which lets you write a quantum circuit as code. Um, in my experience, though, no one actually uses this to write circuits. They all like using the Python API which will, uh, or some other API to build a circuit, because then you can get a nice little picture, and that's uh, handy. Um, this is mostly used by people to save the circuit. So you use a Python API, generate a circuit, and you need some kind of intermediate format to store it. That's what most people um, use Chasm for. And uh, from a compiler perspective, it's actually not that interesting because it's just a parser that's been done before. Uh. And then there's another level of programming quantum computers, um, which is the pulse level. And I'm not going to talk about this too much because it doesn't really apply to us as software engineers, um, people who think algorithmically. Um, each of those quantum gates that I showed um, is represented as a microwave pulse that's applied to the qubit. And 
there's a def definition of that on the back end, which gets applied when you send it. I want to run this operation. It will apply a, a predefined microwave pulse. But you also have the option of just applying the microwave pulse yourself. So you say, I want a pulse of this shape, of this duration, and apply it to the qubit and measure the result manually. Um, this is mostly only used for physics research or people who are working on trying to develop better gates or trying to characterize the hardware, try to get a better feel of the characteristics of a quantum computer. Um, there are some fun scheduling problems around mapping from a logical quantum circuit to the pulse level, but we're not going to be discussing that today. So if we're programming at the bit level, why do we need quantum compilers? I remember from university class, um, you know, you'd write assembly, and that was a one-to-one -one mapping to you know, the uh, byte-level instruction. You could convert it manually to you know, individual bits and see what the registers were doing and all the opcodes. Um, but on a quantum computer, if we're writing that basically the same level, at the bit level, why do we need a compiler? Um, and the answer is, even a circuit like this is still logical and abstract. We're abstracting the realities of what hardware is. Um, and we need to map this to the actual, circuit, to the actual capabilities of the hardware. Um, and that becomes a really interesting problem because today's devices uh, are quite limited. Um, there's not a lot of bits. They have all sorts of other limitations. Um, and we can see this with this example. This example is actually one I took for my slides last year, um, which was an example pro program I ran for a uh, an Oracle problem for those who were in the room last year. Um, and when we compile this, we can see uh, two examples. So this is running on the same five qubit device. Um, and I just picked good compiler settings on the bottom and really bad ones on the top. And you can kind of see it. Um, if you, you don't really need to worry about all the details because we'll be going into them in a bit. But you can see there's just a lot more stuff on the top than there is on the bottom. And when I run this on a quantum computer, um, you can see that in the results. So there's one right answer to that circuit. It always should return a bit string of all ones, which is the rightmost number. And you can see on the good compilation, we get that about 56% of the time. But on the left, we get it 28% of the time, and it's just random noise. We didn't even get the right answer. Um, the reason we run the experiment, this one I ran 1,000 times, is because uh, quantum computers behave randomly, even when, uh, even when you have a deterministic program. You can get a result that uh, oscillates between 1 and 0 because we're collapsing that state, which is more complex, to a 1 or a 0. Um, but also because there's noise in the quantum computer. So like, we got the right answer, but we also got all the other answers. Uh, and you need to run it a lot of times to see which one you get the most, because there's no error correction. Um, and so. We need to understand what these constraints are on the quantum computer before we can build a compiler for it. So it's, the first constraint is the basis gates or the basis set. Um, so I showed you that big table of all the quantum gates before. Turns out typical quantum computers run only three or four of them. Um, I've got two examples for two different types of qubit technologies. The top one is what IBM uses, uh, trapped ions. There are some other companies experimenting with those types of qubits. And then a simulator runs pretty much everything, but not all of them. Um, and before we can run a program defined with any uh, logic gate on it, we have, to be, we have to make sure it's in the basis set that the device actually understands. Otherwise, when we send a, a job to the quantum computer, it won't know what we're talking about and will fail. Um, the next constraint is connectivity. So this is a die photo of one of the quantum chips, uh, actually the same one I ran that example on before, uh, which is called uh, named Yorktown. It's also in Yorktown Heights, New York, um, but other devices have names of cities, like there's one in Melbourne, but that's also in Yorktown Heights, New York. It's not actually in Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, it's not confusing at all. I, the first six months I was working on the team, I might have thought they were, they were all over the world and not just down the hall. <laughs> um, but what this really shows is besides only being five qubits, you see those things labeled B that run between the qubits? There is only connectivity between some of the qubits. Those Bs are bus resonators, and they're needed for any operation that we run on more than one qubit. So all those CNOT gates, the ones with the lines and little circles, they can only be run between qubits that have a connectivity between them with those lines. Um, 
So if we're running an arbitrary circuit and we can put lines between all of the qubits, how can we run it if we only have limited connectivity? Um, for something like this, it's small and easy. You could probably do it by hand. It's, uh, in fact, we will later. Um, but when you have a bigger one, this is the logical map from the 53 qubit device. I don't actually have a die photo of it, and I'm sure we wouldn't be able to see all the little wires. But um, it's a bit more complex when you have a lot more qubits. And as the complexity of quantum computers grows and things get more sophisticated, this just becomes a harder mapping problem. And then there's also another problem with what if you don't have enough connectivity? Um, so in the example before, the five qubit one, I didn't show the logical map, but only one qubit has connectivity to all the other ones. What if you have a circuit like this, where you've got Q0, which has a line between all the other qubits, and Q1, which has a line between all the qubits? How can you run that on the circuit if only one qubit has a line to all the other ones? Um, the answer to that is the swap gate I mentioned before. You can move the state around after you've performed your operation to try to move things around so you can have connectivity between the qubits where you need it. The problem with that is a swap gate is expensive. When you decompose it to the CNOT, it ends up being three operations. So if we have to swap a lot, we add a lot of CNOTs. And that comes up for the next uh, constraint, which is the largest one, which is noise and errors. Um, the biggest issue with quantum computing today is that there's errors in every single thing you do. Um, you can see there, there's, in this diagram, there's errors when you apply a gate. Um, you can see the error rates between like zero and point, uh, probably 0.12%. Um, and then when you apply multi-qubit gates, there's even higher error rate. There's errors when you read, when you measure. That uh, looks like it's around 2%, which seems pretty high. Um, so every time you perform an operation, there's just a chance it'll be wrong. It won't do what you want it to do. Um, and then there's decoherence. Um, which is, you, we can only maintain the quantum state for a certain amount of time. There are two types, this is measured in two ways. There's T1, the T1 time, which is the time if you have a qubit at state one, the excited state, on the, when the uh, line pointing down on that block sphere. Um, it's the time it takes for that to just go back to zero. Um, and then there's T2, which is a little bit more um, complex. It's when it's in that, hyper, uh, in that superposition state, when the arrow is between zero and one where it will just dephase. And then when you apply a Hadamard to get it back in the basis state, you, you'll get a random answer. You don't know what it is. Um, these times are typically on tens of microseconds. So I've seen some numbers. Uh, it varies by device and by calibration, a lot of environmental factors. But if, uh, when you query the device and ask what its decoherence times are, you'll typically see between like 10 microseconds and the highest I've seen is like 90 microseconds, which is not a lot of time to do your work. And each of these gates are microwave pulses, which are measured in real time. So you run a number of gates, you're, you're, you've got a little time budget, and once you go over that, you'll lose your quantum state and you'll get random noise, which is actually what happened on the bad compiler example I showed before. There were just too many operations and we got random noise, and that's why we didn't get the right answer. And that's where the project I work on comes in, um, Kiskit Terra project. It's part of a larger, suite of software for dealing with quantum computers. Uh, Terra is the one that's interacting with the hardware. It's the software-hardware interface. It provides a Python API for writing circuits. So all of the diagrams and stuff, I actually use Terra to generate in this presentation. It lets you construct your circuits, interact with them, modify them, visualize them. But then it also has the compiler, which takes those abstract circuits and sends, uh, compiles them for arbitrary hardware. Um, it supports any kind of hardware. Um, out of the box, we include IBM's, uh, IBM's quantum computers because that's, we're developing it, but there's other backends available for other companies' quantum computers. Um, and it's written in Python, which is great for me because I'm mainly a Python hacker. It's Apache 2 licensed. Um, and the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna be going through how Terra works with compiling circuits so we can see how, how you actually do this in practice. And to talk about how Terra is doing this, the first thing we have to start with is the directed acyclic graph, or the DAG, uh, which we use internally in Terra to represent a quantum circuit. So instead of having that big diagram, we just throw everything on a DAG like this. Um, all of these examples I've shown so far, except for that one bad compiler one, are all the same circuit. So that chasm program, the pulse example with all the little 
uh, graphs and then the actual circuit. They're all this, and it's the same thing. So this DAG representation um, lets us see the flow of information much easier than we would in a circuit. Um, and each node is either an input, an operation, or an output, and the edges in the DAG represent the flow of data, so which, which bits the operation is touching. And the explicitness is a real advantage. So in this circuit on the left, which I just threw together to make it easy to see this, um, you can see that we've got operations on qubit zero and one, and then we have a measurement, and then we have another operation on qubit one, and that has a classical control. The classical control means just run this when the classical bits are at a certain number. So in that case, it's zero, one, zero. Uh, the dot coloring and shading is what indicates that. Um, and then, but when we put that in the DAG on the right, we can see there's actually a relationship between qubit zero and that RZ gate, um, which is not really easy to see to, in the circuit itself because there's no, nothing on zero actually touching RZ, but because we measure it and it goes to the classical bits, we can see that. And the DAG lets us see this pretty easily um, because we can just see that Q zero line to the measure and it's all, it's, it's just the advantage of the graph structure. And then, <laughs> naming things. Um, you might notice it says transpiler. Inside Terra, we call the part that does all of the work in the compiler the transpiler because someone thought that was the proper name. Um, I don't really agree with that name because when I think of transpiler, when you Google search transpiler, it says it's a compiler that translates from one language to another. Um, but our input is a circuit, our output is a circuit. How is that translating? Um, but so you might see transpiler in a few other places here. Uh, but the way this works is the compiler or transpiler is built up using passes. So we've got this DAG structure that represents our circuit, and we have a bunch of passes. Each pass has a well-defined job. So for example, you know, look at the circuit, find something. Um, and the pass manager iterates over these passes and schedules them. So there's dependency between operations, things, uh, things need to modify it and then put it in a certain state and then that becomes a dependency for another pass. Pass manager tracks all of that and also has some flow control things like do while loops, um, if then else kind of statements. And it lets you build a pipeline for transforming the circuit. Um, the other thing it does is it tracks global state. So as we're making modifications to the circuit, as we're optimizing it or fitting it to the hardware, we might have to save some state about what's going on in the DAG so we can use that in later optimizations. And it contains a Python dictionary we call the property set, which is just free form fields for that kind of information. And there are two types of passes in the transpiler or compiler. There's an analysis pass and a transformation pass. An analysis pass, like its name implies, is just to analyze the DAG. So it only has read access to an input DAG, and it can write to the property set. So it can analyze the state of the circuit or the DAG, and then write that to a property set. Um, and then there are transformation pass passes, which do the opposite. They transform the DAG, and they can read the property set. So they can get information out that we've already analyzed, and then modify things. Um, and this lets us um, reuse data pretty easily. There are several types of passes that require the same kind of analysis up front, but um, we don't want to do that multiple times, so this lets us save the state. And a typical pass manager uh, is built up in a certain flow. Uh, typically, you do your logical reductions, which are things uh, that just simplify the circuit. You can just look at it and say, oh, these operations are redundant. We can make them one at the logical level. Then we map it to the hardware, or which is called embedding, which involves three stages, layout, mapping, and unrolling. And then we do physical reductions or optimizations, which is after we've embedded the circuit to be physical for a specific piece of hardware, we can optimize it even further. Um, the nice thing about the pass manager is it's 100% pluggable and extensible. Um, so there's no, you know, predefined way of doing this. You can say, here are my passes, I want to build a pass manager like this, and you've got your pass manager, and it's like, oh no, wait, I want to change that. And you can, there's an API to go and construct this as suited for your needs. Um, 
And there are also people out there and companies out there that will sell you transpiler passes um, because they say they can do things better and they'll charge you for it. Um, but that's totally fine because it's all Python code, so you can just write a module and import it and it works fine. Um, and you can see here some of the names of the passes on the right, just Python class names. Um, and we're gonna start looking at some of these passes now. Or, sorry, we're gonna be looking at uh, the preset pass managers now. So out of the box, we include four pass managers that give you general results, the best case general results, like our best guess. If you can think of it like uh, GCC, for example, with their O flags, uh, O1 through O3. We have four optimization levels, zero or through three. Uh, actually based off GCC's optimization levels. And these are like just the default settings. But if you want to get into it, you can totally have fun with the F flags on GCC and you know, unroll all your loops. Yeah, uh, um, we, that's what like a custom pass manager would be. Um, and from zero to three, we increase the level of optimization we perform at the cost of execution time. I don't expect anyone to be able to actually read this, but this is just a flow chart of each optimization or each pass manager at each optimization level to see the, op, uh, see the uh, operations it's performing. But optimization level zero does no optimization. Um, it just maps the input circuit to the hardware and runs it. And it always, almost always gives a bad result because there's no optimization and you'll hit decoherence. Um, so it just, no optimization, just unrolls it, lays it out for the circuit and does swap mapping uh, in case it needs to and then that's it, and it, that's good enough to make it run, and you'll see what your results are. Probably bad. <laughs> um, then there's level one, which just adds on the bottom left a um, optimization stage, where it runs two optimization passes in a for loop, or in a do while loop, and it looks to see if the depth of the output circuit has changed. So if, if it runs the loop twice and it gets the same length of circuit, it says, okay, that's good enough. It moves on and says we're done. Optimization level two just changes one of the passes to one that's a little bit better and a little bit slower. And optimization level three just throws the kitchen sink at it. Um, it replaces most of the optimization passes in that, for loop, in that do while loop and just tries everything it can to try to make it as small as possible. Um, and depending on your input circuit, it can be kind of slow, um, especially for larger ones because some of these passes uh, do a lot of linear algebra. It takes some time for the computer to catch up, especially if you're on a little laptop. So let's take a look at some of these passes. Um, the first one is the unroller. Um, the unroller is pretty simple. The, when we were talking about basis sets before, the quantum computers have only certain gates they support. The unroller just decomposes each of the operations in a descent tree to get to the ones that the quantum computer knows about. So in this case, the quantum computer knows about CX and U3. And it's just decomposing the gates until it reaches the state that we know about. Um, the problem with this approach is that we built it for IBM's quantum computer. So all the definitions we have for the gates internally are in terms of IBM's uh, basis gates, which is a problem when you want to run it on other ones because the way it works is we decompose it to IBM's basis state and then we convert it to whatever the other one is at the end, which can be inefficient because you can end up with this giant circuit that's you know, in IBM's basis state and you could do it more efficiently on, with a different basis set. Um, so there's work ongoing to do this, but it's pretty simple. Each one of these gates has a definition that can be defined in terms of another gate and it's just, um, we're working on an algorithm to make it better. Um, the next one is uh, a fun one, or I think it's fun because it's, it's a little um, deceptive. It's layout um, or the initial mapping of logical qubits to physical qubits. Um, out of the box, we include three algorithms for them, uh, trivial layout, dense layout, and noise adaptive layout. Uh, trivial layout is trivial. Um, it looks at the qubits on the quantum circuit, goes from top to bottom and says, your qubit one, your qubit two, your qubit three, and it just puts it on the circuit. Um, dense layout is 
is a little bit more involved. It does a constraint problem. So it looks at the degree of each node in the graph, so uh, of, in the logical circuit, and looks at the degree of each node in the coupling map and some other constraints, and tries to match them as closely as it can, and says, okay, you're the closest match. I'll put you there. Um, and the last one is the most involved one, which is the noise adaptive layout, which is similar to dense layout, slightly different constraint algorithm, but it also factors in hardware noise. So it might not pick what ends up being the smallest circuit, but the one that ends up being the best performing because maybe the circuit that it could be, yeah, it could be on a qubit that's really noisy. It could make the circuit smaller, but you've got a high error rate on that one qubit and you're, you'll get bad answers. Um, so we can look at this in practice. Um, so I built that example circuit on the left. It's a logical circuit that's not mapped to hardware. And we're gonna run it on this device. Um, Anyone want to take a guess on some mapping here? It might help if I show it like this, sorry. This is the logical map, so you don't have to trace little wires. You can see the connectivity between all the qubits. Um, does anyone want to take a guess? Yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, and Kizkatera lets us specify that um, in the API. So when we say we're going to do a, a transpile, we can say, okay, we want this mapping. And I ran that circuit through the compiler with each of those options. Uh, so each optimization level is a different layout mechanism. And then also I used optimization level one and said, no, ignore the layout mechanism built in. I want this layout. And you can see here, trivial layout did a really bad job. There's swaps all over the place. You remember that three C not pattern? You see that everywhere. Dense layout only has one swap, or sorry, three swaps. So less swaps, um, so it's a little bit better. And noise adaptive layout, um, I don't think has any swaps, but it did not pick what we picked. We picked, and you can see it's much smaller what we picked, but the noise adaptive one did not pick that. And when we run this on the actual device, and I sat there and ran all, each of these on the actual device and waited in line, we can see um, the answer, and, or what we got back. So the trivial layout, we got a lot of noise. The right answer here are those right two peaks. It's uh, 110 and 111, because while it's, it's a non-deterministic answer, so you'll get like a 50-50 shot of either of those answers. Um, you can see it. trivial layout, we got a ton of noise. Dense layout, we got less noise. That'd probably be passable uh, if you're working with it, because you can just say cut off. These are my answers. Noise adaptive layout, we got a really good answer. Very little noise. Um, and then the custom layout one, I'm not exactly sure what happened there. I think it might be um, that one of the qubits we picked was noisy. Um, it could also be someone sneezed in the lab. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Um, but you, you get a feel for what I'm, what I'm talking about with layout and how it can be pretty important. You wouldn't think like just placing it on a, on a device would be that important, but it can really affect things. And I just wanted to take a quick word to talk about swap mapping, because I'm not gonna go into the algorithms, they're a bit more involved for what I can fit in 40 minutes. Um, but after we finish the layout step, we're gonna always have to swap map, even if we don't end up swapping. We need to check to make sure that connectivity of the device fits with what our input circuit is. Um, and just like before, there are three algorithms we run, or three algorithms available in Qiskit for doing this. There's basic swap, look ahead swap, and stochastic swap. And just like before, there's, there, or at least there used to be, performance trade-offs for each of them as you go down the list to see which one's better performing versus runtime, except for stochastic swap, which about six months ago, someone rewrote in Cython, and now it's the fastest and the best performing. Um, and I have a feeling that's gonna be happening to a lot of passes as things get more complicated. Um, but it's just, so they all run the same swap algorithm, and it's, it's pretty good. Um, and I don't really have, have a good way to explain the algorithm because it's based on some heuristics and that's why it's called stochastic swap. Um, the next pass we're gonna look at is a analysis pass. It's the only analysis pass we're gonna look at and the reason is because we're gonna look at a transformation pass that depends on it next. Um, this pass just looks at the circuit and says I want to find isolated blocks of two qubit operations. So it just iterates over the DAG and says, I want to see how big a sub-circuit I can find in that graph that only touches two qubits, and then give me a list of them, and it saves it into the pass manager. And while it's pretty complicated to figure that out on 
the diagram because you know there's overlapping things. It's not just in time. When you put it in the DAG, it's very easy to do this algorithm. You just loop over each C naught, find the ancestors up until a branch, and then you do it all over again. And then it's pretty straightforward. And it's just another example of where the DAG uh, data structure is very efficient for doing these kind of optimizations or analysis. Um, but then we can take that and do some optimizations with it, which are fun. So the consolidate blocks pass is a physical optimization pass that we um, use the data from before. So I used this input circuit um, as for consolidate blocks. And all it does is it loops over the two qubit blocks that we found from the analysis pass, and it runs it through a simulator and says, what is the unitary matrix of this block? Because two qubits is small enough that most computers can simulate it pretty easily. As you get bigger, you can't do that. So two qubits, reasonable size to simulate. and says, OK, what's the unitary matrix of this going to be? Figures it out and replaces the block with a unitary matrix gate, which is just saying this gate is this unitary matrix, which obviously you can't run on a quantum computer. So then we have to decompose it. So here you can see we've got two unitary gates, one for each of those blocks we found in the analysis pass before. And we can decompose it um, with the unroller. And you can see that this is a lot less operations than it was before. It's a much bigger circuit, and it becomes much smaller. And this actually really tripped me up um, when I first started working on things, because I was doing some benchmarking of performance, and I had this giant example circuit that someone gave me from one of their research algorithms from a paper. It had like 1,300 gates. And I put it through, and I was testing the transpiler at each optimization level. Optimization level one, 1,000-something gates. Optimization level two, slightly less gates. And then optimization level three, which runs this, seven gates. <laughs> it's like, oh, God, there's a terrible bug. We're screwing up. Everyone's <laughs> freaking out. And it's like, no, it's just running this pass because it's, it only ran on two qubits. So the whole thing could be simulated and condensed down. So this, this one can have a really big effect. Um, and then I think this is the last pass I'm going to be talking about. Um, it's called Optimize 1Q Operations. And then this one's a, I got a, a special spot in my heart because it's the first one I started hacking on. And it's the first thing that really got me excited about this project. Um, this pass looks at the DAG and finds all the operations in a row on a single qubit and then tries to simplify that. So here we have an example circuit I just threw together with two operations, so two qubits, or two, two gates, which means two rotations. So we can map it out like that. All the pass does is take those two rotations, figures out what the end state is going to be, and makes it one rotation. Um, and it, for all those people who are, know 3D graphics, it uses quaternions, the same kind of stuff you do for rotations in 3D space and video games or 3D graphics or anything else. It just uses the same, same math for it. Um, and then when you find that rotation, you can just use one of those arbitrary rotation gates I was talking about before, and what was two operations became one. Well, this gets really powerful, though, if, if you've got a big row of lots of one qubit operations, you can always condense it down to one. It's just a little bit of trigonometry. Um, so with that, I wanted to talk a bit about, um, that was all I wanted to talk about, about the actual internals of the compiler. You get a feel for how we, the, the importance of a compiler and how we, how we go about using it to perform operations and algorithmically how it works. Um, I wanted, as I come to the end of the presentation, I wanted to hit home how important this actually is in real world. Uh, quantum volume uh, is the benchmark we use at IBM for measuring the performance of all of our quantum computers. The way it works is we build increasingly, we build uh, increasing size random input circuits. So it's, it's a square input circuit. And we want to figure out how big of one of those squares we can run on the quantum computer. Um, and this is not just a function of number of qubits. Um, while it is a number of function of number of qubits, it's also a function of how many gates can you run. Because as we increase the number of qubits in the experiment, we also have to increase the depth because it's square. And this characterizes the hardware very well because it shows you like what's your error rate, what's your decoherence time. Because if you get any error on any of the qubits, you'll get the wrong answer and the benchmark fails. 
And, but the software plays a really key role in here. Improvements in the software mean you can run a deeper circuit because it'll optimize it or fit it better, and you'll get better results. And this is, I really like this benchmark because it makes my job seem more important, I guess, um, because we can get, we, we can say, okay, this quantum computer behaves better. It's got a quantum volume of, uh, you know, 36 or 32. I, there, there was just a press release the other day of, that we released a new quantum volume computer that's bigger than any of the other ones we've done before. And the software plays a big part in that because if the software's, if the software's bad, then we're gonna get bad results, just like I showed on one of the earlier slides. So I just, I wanted to end the presentation talking about how important this is in quantum computing because it's not just, you know, a little pet project on the side to uh, have fun with, which, I mean, I, I enjoy what I do for work, so it is for the, that for me. Um, oops. So with that, that was all I had for prepared material. I've got about 10 minutes for questions. I rushed through that. I was worried I was going to run out of time. So I'm sure people have questions. I also have a ton of links here for more information, including one for the IBM Quantum Experience, where there are, I think it's 10 quantum computers that are open to the public. You just sign up for an account, and you can submit jobs to it. And I ran all of the graphs with results on at those publicly available quantum computers. So you can actually reproduce my results. There's a script in the repo if you wanted to do that. Um, and also just some more information like an open source textbook and my presentation from last year. So with that, I'll open to questions if anyone has any. Uh, so if you, if you, this on, um, if you go back to the slide where you had the results from the, the, the four different uh, ones you had, um, my question was, yeah, so how, what is the threshold with which you know there's too much noise? So it's like the first one, I mean, you kind of have an answer, right? Yeah, like, you, that you... would be passable. Okay. Or like, it depends on what you're trying to do. Like if okay. you're, if you, this one, we know what the answer is. Right. What if so, we didn't know what the answer was? I mean, it's, the two are still bigger than the other one. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, what it, like, it, it looks like, you know, like a two-thirds more than the other yeah. one. So I guess, I guess mostly my question is, like, if, if you didn't know the answer, like, how do you know that's good enough? Or Honestly, would you know? I was giving this presentation last year, that would have been good enough. <laughs> um, okay. The problem was I had this example that I wrote when the talk first got accepted, uh -huh. and then there was a hardware revision, and then all, all the results looked like number two. Okay. They all looked the same. So I guess it depends on your workload, but what, would you ever run optimization level one? Well, I guess if the circuit gets big enough and noise gets, it gets more noise. Yeah, it's, it's more of an issue for bigger circuits. This is just an example circuit. Um, I typically actually run with optimization level one because for bigger circuits, optimization level three is way too slow. Okay, so it's speed that you, you trade for it's the different speed, optimization speed levels. For, yeah, speed versus optimization. Okay, thank you. Okay, so when you're talking about optimizations and you showed optimization level three and it had all these optimizations, how do you know which order to apply those in? Because obviously the output of one can affect, can affect then you should have run the other one first, right? Like do you run multiple times? Do you? Yeah, it runs multiple times. So I know no one can read this and I tried every single way I could to scale this image to be legible on a projector and there was no way I could figure out how to do it. Um, but in this box on the bottom left, in very, very tiny letters, it says do while. Okay, right. And then go. it says at the very top, depth and fixed point. And what that is saying is this entire thing runs in a big do while loop until it reaches a fixed point in depth. So it's measuring how deep the circuit is and trying to figure out when it stays the same after two iterations and says, okay, I'm done. Excellent, good, thanks. No problem. Sitting there like stunned mullet, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's lunchtime. Matthew, thank you very much for that. In appreciation, a little book from... Oh, thank you. Put your hands together.